Okay, so these uh, next set of speaker speakers are from Google. Um, they're going to come up to have a, a nice intro, so I'm just going to uh, quickly let you know that they tried to invite uh, Keanu Reeves to, to kick off their uh, test talk. It turns out GTAC tickets sold out so fast, they couldn't get them one, so sorry, Keanu. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Thomas Kinch, uh, Stefan Ramsauer, and Valera Zakharov, who are going to talk to you about breaking the matrix, Android testing at scale. Imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. You could say that. I can see it in your eyes. You have the look of a man who is executing all these tests by hand now. Ironically, that's not far from the truth. Do you believe in manual testing, Nia? No. Why not? Because I don't like the idea that people should do the same thing over and over. I know exactly what you mean. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know, you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it since 2006, that there's something wrong with mobile. You don't know what it is, but it's there like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It's this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? The manual testing matrix? Do you want to know what it is? The testing matrix covers everything. It means testing on all phones on every API level. Now even, it means testing on your glasses. Soon you'll have to test on your watch. You already need to test on TV. You need to test on cars. You need to test on different networks. It's the spreadsheet that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you on the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, your manual tests are catching bugs that could have been caught with automation or emulation immediately. A prison for your mind. Your life is being wasted installing app on a hundred different phones. you know you'll never prevent a regression. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue tablet. The story ends. You go home, test however you want. You take the red tablet. You stay at GTAC and I show you how deep the automation goes. So we're here for the blue tablet. Are we just going to give up, go home, test however we want to test? I don't care. Or are you guys going to take the red tablet, stay here, find out what me and my team do, and see how deep the automation can go? Red? red? That's great. The blue tablet sucks. I have no slides for that. You'd have to leave. So um, I'm Tom Kinch. I'm a staff SCT at Google. Uh, with me today are Stefan and Valera. And uh, in the audience is Yvonne and Ashwin. Uh, together, our team uh, focuses on making the lives of Android developers at Google 
as awesome as possibly can be. Um, so we want to share some of our efforts that you might be interested in that area. So first off, why are we talking about automation and mobile together? What really makes this uh, special or interesting? Well, um, I kind of put on the slides here terms that everyone can understand. Um, uh, so what's the computational complexity of this function? Uh, how, does, how fast is it going to start growing? It's OK. This isn't an interview. <laughs> um, I was hoping for some answers and then you know, maybe get some people from my team. But uh, basically, let's say you know, for every test we have, for every device that we want to test on, for every API that device supports, that's another test. And uh, we can kind of visualize that more like this. Um, actually, there's a problem here. Uh, we're going to need to clone each one of those devices uh, for every API level that it supports. And that quickly leads us to another problem. The desk is like really crowded right now. And um, they're just not going to fit. So I'm really excited to uh, announce today the launch of a totally awesome new product uh, called Google Desk. It is a desk that can hold literally 100,000 devices. So um, no, actually, I'm, I'm not going to announce that. It got uh, canned because uh, apparently it was going to mess up our carbon offsets. We'd have to like chop down something like 20 acres of forest per desk. <laughs> so unfortunately, most developers' desks actually don't look like that. Um, they might have one phone. They might have a smart uh, tablet they share amongst the team. But um, when they talk about testing, they mean they're going to push the app and press some buttons, and hey, it looks good to me. Um, the core problem seems easily paralyzable. We have basically the same test. We have the same device, uh, a set of devices we want to run on. But we are really getting tripped up on how to automate those tests. And um, you know, honestly, I haven't seen too many teams that have got it right. Uh, there's more than a few problems that are blocking them. First off, you know, just having a place to run your tests is painful. You got to have those devices on your desk. Um, you got to have the right ones, the ones the users are having problems with or that you think might be interesting. So you know, you constantly see someone running around. Who has a Droid Razor? Uh, who has a Nexus One? They're in museums now, actually. <laughs> Uh, but somehow there's someone complaining about Play Store, uh, saying that their app isn't running on their Nexus One and they don't want to buy a new one. Um, and uh, the other like core problem is like it's not really fun to write tests on Android. And we've been talking on and on about developers needing to write tests. Um, and there's lots of benefits to that. But if it's a painful process, you're going to face lots of resistance. And uh, it is a painful process. But does anyone not think it's painful? Great. I was worried that like, you know, we might have to have an intervention here. So let's go back to our first problem. Um, you want to develop an Android app. You have no idea how to do it. You read developer.android.com. And you'll read this lovely statement that I pulled out of there um, that I always mess up when I say it. But I think I'll get it right this time because I'm reading it right on the screen. <laughs> when building a mobile application, it's important that you test your application on the real device before releasing it to users. And I've seen this be twisted so many ways, but eventually boils down to this. We can only test on real devices. There's no other way to catch bugs in our application. And I hear very smart, technically competent people saying this. Um, I'm sure you guys hear it too. And I'm sure there's someone, or maybe yourself that you know, that hears this statement and then is tasked with you know, building a lab of those devices. And I'm sorry, you know, you're probably thinking something like back to uh, your web testing days, where your tests are running on a nice, austere piece of data center hardware, no problem. Uh, you just send some tests there, start your server, start the tests, they run, everyone's happy, no big deals. It can't be too much harder, right? With uh, you know your smartphones, you just need some USB cables, a hub, you know, and some cool-looking phones. <laughs> Uh, 
unfortunately, you quickly start to realize that there's a lot of differences between this piece of consumer hardware, which was made to be cute and uh, really enjoyable, and this piece of boring data center hardware. <laughs> Uh, first off, the data center hardware, their manufacturers have, you know, published numbers of, you know, the mean time between failure. Like, when is this thing going to break? You can plan, like, when you need to replace them. Um, consumer hardware has a similar concept. You're going to the store to buy a new one every six months. <laughs> it was not designed to be running 24-7, uh, 365, uh, executing your tests. And if you try to do that, they will probably fall over and break in very interesting ways. Um, when you want to go buy a new piece of data center hardware, it's pretty easy, right? You know, you have a contact at HP, IBM, Compaq, something. You can easily walk, uh, call them up, get the device into your data center. It'll be rackable, easy to support. Um, consumer hardware is a little harder. Actually, a team at Google uh, realized that they needed this, uh, a couple of phones from AT&T we didn't have. And how do they get it? Well, um, the uh, PM uh, went down to the mall <laughs> with her credit card, and she bought uh, like $800 worth of phones. And the guy's like, uh, why are you buying all these? And she was a little awkward and said, mm, yeah, you know, um, they're, they're presents. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, if one of those happened to break, you know, she would have to walk back, schlep back to the mall and like return it versus like maybe having a vendor come on site. So you're sitting there, you know, with your Hello Kitty phone, trying to wonder if it's the phone that's not running, the test that's not running, that was running code you think was bad, that's why you were testing it. Uh, it, it is it the phone? Is it the USB cable? Is it the battery? Is it the hub? You sigh. You say, uh, I wish I was at Google. I bet their device labs are like totally awesome. <laughs> like they totally solved this problem. Um, why aren't they telling us how they did it? Uh, well, this is actually a Google device lab I spotted in the wild a couple of years ago. <laughs> and for you poor souls that uh, are building a device lab, um, I have one major warning. And I saw in a previous presentation someone else was making this mistake. Don't try to break the law of gravity. You're doing so many difficult things here. Um, that's a bad idea. In this picture, like those um, phones are attached by a little bit of glue on the whiteboard. Which looks totally cool. You can watch the phones execute uh, the test when you're in the room. And you're like, oh, wow, these people got it down. <laughs> but what happens is the phone gets hot because the CPU is constantly running. And the glue gets a little you know, uh, <laughs> melted. And then the phones hit the floor, break. And there's much upsetness, gnashing of teeth. And yeah, so um, flat level surface people, you know? It's expensive hardware. I could go on and on, um, listing all the problems that you are going to have to solve if you are building a device lab. Uh, earlier, I saw you know, some people have gone to the point where like, they make their own um, breadboards and you know, rack them up. And uh, wow, that looked really difficult. Um, you have your security concerns. You know, I saw some of you people looking at my Hello Kitty phone. You're not getting it. Um, it is super cool. <laughs> Uh, their maintenance burdens, the phones um, you know, constantly need to be upgraded. They're not ex cheap. Um, the hardware is flaky. They are all like weird shapes. Uh, they have different power supplies. They generate a lot of heat. You get a lot of them in one room, and then all of a sudden, the Wi-Fi stops working. Um, all in all, you're going to be sinking some pretty uh, big bucks into your device lab. Very smart engineers. Uh, it's a big hole, and it's something that, like you know, normal companies, I don't really expect uh, to be able to solve the problem. I mean, why spend that time and effort when you could be doing useful things? So at this point, you're shaking your head. You've been tasked with building this device lab, and you just realize that there's so many, you know, um, issues you're going to hit, and maybe like it doesn't make sense. Like, if we can't even get a place to run our tests, why are we writing them, you know? I mean, it seems kind of silly. But um, why, why are we hung up on real phones? Like, what bugs do you guys expect to catch on a phone or a device that, you know, would only happen on my Galaxy Nexus or Hello Kitty phone? Anyone? 
timing issues, hardware issues, Bluetooth and GPS, right? Yeah. Battery issues, UI issues. OK, I got a good collection here. But you know, um, all in all, I don't know about the bugs you guys write, but when I write bugs, I very rarely am doing GPS work or Bluetooth work. The majority of bugs you're going to find in your code don't care if they're running on a Galaxy Nexus or you know, uh, a Hello Kitty phone. They will reproduce anyway. Uh, we have a lovely little song and dance number over here. Um, but an off by one error, concurrency, buffer overflows, these problems, they don't care. Uh, you can reproduce them on almost anything, but we're fooling over ourselves to get real devices to make them happen. And uh, you know, when you can say, like, you know, most of your bugs boil down to using less than instead of greater than, you know, it seems kind of silly to expend all that engineering talent. And you know what? You know, beyond those trivial logic bugs that actually aren't trivial, they make up the bulk of bugs and sources of user dissatisfaction. You know, what we, if we could replicate the OS version we're running on, the screen size, the memory constraints, we're catching even more and more bugs um, that our users might hit. And we're starting to really narrow the class of the bugs that could happen on physical devices. So we can write targeted tests for the pieces of our code that interact with Bluetooth or GPS. Um, and after all of our functional tests pass and our code looks good from a, that standpoint, we can take the code and then run those targeted tests on our precious physical devices. And if those tests pass, then we can take the app, give it to a, our very good and talented exploratory testers and have them use it like a real user and not you know, executing lines on a spreadsheet, but actually <laughs> testing the app creatively. Um, and the best thing about this is you know, we can do this with emulators. And emulators let us go back home to the data center. Uh, it's really beautiful when you can scale at the rate of uh, a data center. And you know, we have our Google data centers, but there's Amazon data centers, and you, know, you might have your own. Um, in Google, we've been able to run 82 million Android tests in March uh, in our data centers. Uh, does anyone know how many seconds there are in the month of March? It's about 2.5 million. Um, so I'm thinking we're scaling reasonably well. We're running in the data center. It's a beautiful, reproducible environment. I'm not running on your phone versus his tablet. And like having a bug I can't reproduce, it's all like relatively hermetic most of the time. Ari, it's not totally hermetic. We sometimes mess up with that. <laughs> but it's good, right? So wait, um, wait, wait, wait. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is this? <laughs> uh, we all know emulators aren't realistic. So why should we use it to run our test? We believe in testing, right? <laughs> Actually, the Android emulator is different. It is just another device, which means it emulates real phone hardware. If you take a look at the Android source code, you will find a device called Goldfish. And Goldfish represents the emulator hardware. If you are compiling the source code for Goldfish, we get a kernel and we get a system image for the emulator, which is almost identical to an image for a real phone. But what we are compiling? We are compiling the Android architecture. But don't worry, I'm not going into details. Only this. If you look at the lowest part, this is the device-dependent part. I have a question here. Where do you think most of the bugs occur on this chart? No idea? You're right. Actually, it's not on the chart. You know where the bugs are, right? So it really doesn't matter if you're executing our tests on an emulator or on a phone. For the test code, it is the same environment. But at Google, we didn't stop here. We made a few improvements to the emulator we use internally at Google. We create configurations to match device specifications, like RAM size, screen resolution, screen density orientation, and so on. We made modification to the operating system it's easy because all emulator images are rooted by default. We overrode system properties like model name, so it reports Nexus 4 instead of SDK. So we get realistic 
user agent strings. Um, we install some test-friendly services to dismiss system dialogues, dismiss ANRs. You know all about this. It makes your tests flaky. And at Google, we have more and more logging information. We don't stop at just having snippets from Logcat. I would say we pick up every last drop of logging information we can get out of the emulator. Remember this scene? What a poor developer, right? See all those cables. And with our solution, it could look like this. Isn't this nice? You can launch any of those devices with any available API level within seconds. Use it from Eclipse or any IDE you prefer. There is really no need for real devices. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's slow, right? I remember when I first tried um, Honeycomb. I was downloading the images, start the emulator, and it was in the boot screen. I killed the process because I, I thought, hey, it's broken. I downloaded it again, started, same situation, right? Grab a coffee, come back to my desk, and the login screen was there. But it was really not usable. So what should we do? Give up? Should I go home? No, hey, we are engineers, right? We never accept the status quo. So let's investigate why it is slow. First off, as you know, it is a real device, so it has to boot. This is the Android boot sequence. Quite long, right? But if you take a closer look, it is similar to desktop operating system boot sequences. And on the desktop, we have a solution to fix it. It's called hibernation. And you know what? The Android emulator has the same feature. It's just a different name. They call it snapshot. So let's take a snapshot here and save some boot time. But it is not only the boot time, right? After I got my coffee, going back to my desk, it was not usable. I tried to log in, sliding does not work, clicking, all is really slow. And here we have a real phone and we have an emulator. Quite simple, right? Android running on phone hardware and Android running on an emulator on your host hardware. So where, where is the bottleneck, right? Look, somebody draw this nice yellow rectangle there, right? That was good. So it is the code execution on the emulated CPU. Typically, this is way, way slower than running native code. What about if you just remove this part? Running directly on our host CPU. What we need is just two things, right? Typically, our host hardware is x86. So we need Android system for x86. And we need a feature called VM acceleration. And both of them are available with the current SDK. So just go home, download the current SDK, use x86, use VM acceleration, and you get a really, really lightning fast emulator. So now we have a place where we can run reliable and fast our tests. What I'm going to show you now is a demo where we run a UI test suite on a Nexus 4 and on an emulator. What do you think? Which device is faster? Gentlemen, start okay. your engine! I guess we need faster devices, right? <laughs> OK. Seems to be done, right? We have a place where we can run reliable. Our tests is fast. It is cheap. It scales. And for our developers, 
you know, any device with any API level, it's just a fingertip away. So it was a lot of work, and I would say, let's go home, let's have a beer. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really like beer. Um, but uh, so we have a place to run tests. Let's see, our developers have really cool devices at their fingertips. Are we missing anything? Oh, yeah, um, that part. Don't be that guy. <laughs> be this guy instead, OK? Jackie Chan, really wise man. But let's analyze the situation. I mean, why is it so hard to write tests for Android? You know, every time I go to a developer and I say write tests for Android, they, there's this huge resistance. Uh, and you know, let's take a step back and think um, in the web development world, where everything has long been figured out, right? Uh, you're told you read books like X unit test patterns, and they say, stay away from UI testing. It's slow, it's flaky. And the way you sort of bypass that issue is that you separate your business logic from your presentation logic, uh, from your UI logic. Uh, and you can use that one of the very popular patterns, MVC, MVP. So in, this, uh, in these patterns, the business logic lives in your controller or your presenter. The view logic is trivial, and everything is great. You just write lo lots of unit tests for your controller or presenter, um, and you're very happy. And then you start, you, know, you move to Android. You follow the Android development guide. You write your first Hello World activity, and everything is awesome. You're running on emulators. And then you think, OK. I'm good now, right? I, I need to start writing some tests. I mean, actually, you should have been writing tests first, but you know, most of us don't do that. And then you think, well, what is an Android activity? Is it a view or is it a presenter? And the answer is yes. It's both. And unfortunately, the Android architecture couples business logic uh, and UI logic together, packages it really nicely for you in this activity. You know, there's this great context object being passed around. And so here, as a developer, you have a choice. Either you're going to write lots of boilerplate, uh, and you are going to artificially go against the grain of what the development guide is telling you, and you can separate your UI logic from your business logic. Or you arrive at a place where you actually need to do some UI manipulation to actually get at some of the complicated pieces of your code. And thankfully, the Android, uh, the Android uh, SDK provides you awesome tools for that. Uh, and if you've written tests for Android, I'm sure you're aware of what Android instrumentation is. Uh, it, and Android instrumentation is awesome. Okay? It's this layer that sits on the OS, gives you hooks inside your application, and you can do amazing things. Like you can inject motion events, whatever those are. Uh, you can click on particular coordinates on the screen. You can type text. You can inspect the state of your application and do amazing things. But if you don't know how to play this instrument correctly, then you're going to sound really bad, and your neighbors are just going to hate you. And there have been some attempts to solve this problem. right? Um, and there are actually very popular frameworks out there uh, that are built on top of instrumentation that make it more user friendly. For example, the one that I have experience with is Robotium. Uh, and when I got to uh, Google, actually, I was working on the Google Wallet team. Uh, and uh, you know, we explored our options, and we went through Robotium. We even went a step further, and we made it much more user friendly for specifically to write tests for Google Wallet. So really, developers had no excuse. Uh, and to my surprise, they adopted our framework. And they wrote hundreds and hundreds of tests, UI tests, actually. And it was amazing. Uh, I was really happy. And then we submitted those tests to continuous test execution. And we got this. Yeah, and there were not a lot of presents there. And it's just really unfortunate, right? Because something that should have been a great tool to do test-driven development and a great quality signal, and you know, you're catching your bugs at the time when you're actually developing, it turns into this nightmare. It turns into a huge maintenance burden. You have these build cop rotations, and you know, people are just, you know, just chugging along, and you know, eventually. They say, you know what? As a developer, I get paid to write features, right? I don't get paid to write tests, and I don't have time for this. And we give up, and we go to the beach. <laughs> but 
you know, does it have to be this way? Everyone just assumes that UI is, you know, UI testing is flaky. But why is it? Well, as Tom mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, you know, one of the main classes of bugs is concur concurrency. And in the UI, you know, this is also the case. If uh, you know whatever you see as a user, those are events that get processed on the UI thread. And your test, actually, your instrumentation test, runs on another thread. And so even though you, a developer, as a developer, are thinking procedurally, you know, I'm just going to do a click, and then I'm going to wait for something to happen on the screen, and then I'll assert that you know, that side effect has occurred. What that actually gets translated to in the system uh, is the click uh, actually generates a motion down and a motion up event, and that gets enqueued in the UI queue. Uh, and uh, likely there's actually work happening already there. Right? I mean, if, especially if you're, you've been doing uh, testing previously. And so you get a failure. And so the solution to all our problems, right? Well, yeah, that's, that's an easy one. Hey, it's going to work, right? But remember, we're running in data centers, right? I mean, it may work locally, like, even 99% of the time. But in a data center, you don't have these guarantees. I mean, your job may get paused. Then you may get resumed later on. And you know what? We're back to square one. It just doesn't work. So earlier this year, uh, we got together with the team and we thought, you know, what if we wrote a framework that handles all of this? These issues can be handled, okay? They're, they're, you know, they're a little bit difficult. They require a deep understanding of Android and concurrency. But it can be done uh, with lots of boilerplate. You know, what if we wrote a solution that actually took care of that and, uh, you know, made you just think procedurally, like defining your actions, finding that UI element that you want to interact with, and then doing some assertions. And so we went ahead and we made it possible. And so um, we called this Espresso after having lots of beer. So Ari, I think it's actually possible to have beer and coffee at the same time. Um, and uh, I'm going to stop right there because uh, actually uh, later today there's, uh, I'm giving a lightning talk uh, on this exact topic. So if you're interested in it, please come and check it out. So with Espresso, I think we have the final piece of the puzzle. Okay, we have a place to run our tests. Lots and lots of tests, actually. We don't have to be enslaved by physical devices. We don't have to chase, you know, our our coworkers, you know, to grab that last Nexus 10. And testing, even UI testing, can be fun and easy. But as a wise man once said, one cannot be told how to break the manual testing matrix. You have to see it for yourself. Trinity, please roll the video.
Great, thank you. Wow, that was fantastic. Uh, I'm sure all of you took a lot away from that. I took two things away. One, I think I want a Hello Kitty phone. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll be talking later. And sure. uh, two, uh, gluing your phones to the wall is, is perilous at best. So uh, I'm sure most of you got much more than that out of it. Uh, no, it was truly fantastic work. So uh, what I'd like to do is there's lots of great uh, questions up here on the moderator, so I will read them off. Uh, also, if you want to ask questions uh, in the aisles, that will also work. And at some point, I'll have an Android up here um, that I can hand out. So uh, first question up for you guys. Does automated testing against a range of devices give developers confidence to release without further manual testing? If not, what else is needed? Yeah, um, so that's a good question. And uh, it's actually kind of very specific to the app you're talking about and the team that's doing the development. Because um, certainly, if your team is not writing tests first and you know writing tests for each of those features, yeah, you're not getting coverage and you'll have to do manual testing. So you're going to have to track that. Um, also, I believe we talked about this a little bit during the presentation, but if your app is using features like you know, sensors and uh, you know, Bluetooth and things that are very uh, manufacturer specific because they might choose really cheap hardware, um, you should be writing very targeted tests to exercise those pieces of code so they execute very quickly. Um, but you should also have uh, stubs for them so that you can test the overall logic of your app um, on emulation. Because our goal is right to um, make these tests execute quickly and reliably and have something that's good pushed onto a precious physical phone, do further testing, and then give it to a precious human being who can you know, finally validate it. So, And I actually just wanted to add to that. I think that you know, these precious human beings don't have to be just manual testers. I mean, some of the best testers out there, I find, are, for example, VPs and executives, right? Because when they find bugs, they get fixed. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, I think that if you have really good automation, uh, and, you know, I think that, yeah, you can, like, push the APK onto, you know, your own phone. You can hand it out to your team. And, you know, that's sort of alpha stage uh, dog fooding. And, uh, you know, you can go from there. Yeah, you know, you've truly mastered uh, this whole bug finding thing when you actually start leaving bugs for the executives to find. <laughs> <laughs> that way they feel really good. I found one. Oh, really? <laughs> we might have a fix. Makes them feel good, you know. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we just leave a few out there. Yeah. Um, so, uh, live question. Uh, I think you're up first. So, uh, who you are, where, uh, where you work if you want to, and your question, please. Hi, this is Dipali from the New York Times. Um, thanks for the beautiful uh, presentation, first of all. Uh, I have a question. Does your matrix cover the entire whole coverage of Android devices? And how, how much percentage of uh, results are uh, re uh, reliable? And the follow-up question is, does the matrix cover the Kindle Fire? Because the Kindle Fire is customized Android. <laughs> OK, so first off, uh, just some information about our test flakiness. Like, for example, in the uh, slides or video you saw at the end, that was uh, Google Shopper. Um, which uh, I thank them for volunteering their uh, tests. Uh, but those tests uh, run continuously at every CL. So there's lots of CLs a day that affect them. They are 0.15% flaky. So that's a lot of nines. I'm very happy with that. <laughs> um, so they are very reliable. Now, one thing that I really want to highlight is the bugs you're going to find, the majority of them um, are going to be in your own code. And they're going to reproduce you know, on any device. Uh, it's important to catch those bugs early and fix them quickly, because you don't have a lot of time, um, and you're under a lot of pressure. So when those tests go green, and you need to support some crazy person that decided they were going to fork Android, uh, like, <coughs> I don't know, like Amazon, um, <laughs> you can target your tests for that specifically and know that you're not going to find something stupid like, oh, a null pointer exception happens when I'm not logged into the app. There's no reason to find that out with a human being. So I'm going to summarize this next question. Maybe, Stefan, you want to take yeah. this. Um, it says, what about bugs that are device specific? Um, you know, we've run into issues where the automation works. We put it on a physical device. It doesn't work. So uh, first off, uh, what we, our experience is, it's more the combination of screen resolution, RAM size, and API level. So this gives you 
their testing metrics, right? And with automation running in the cloud, it's really easy. You can execute in parallel as we have seen on all those devices. Uh, at the end of the day, I would say we're catching 99% of all bugs with our solution. And there could be that, you know, some vendors have a special UI modification, et cetera, and we cannot catch them in an emulator because we are running on Google experienced Android. Yeah, and I think, you know, we want to, we, we kind of wanted to be a little provocative here and get the thinking going, uh, because I think the most of the thinking so far has been on the device-specific side. We're not saying that there is no place for device testing at all, right? We are, there is, there is still a place for it, but you know, you need to do it when you have done everything else. You know, start easy, start with the, with the easy stuff first. Sure. And I would also like to point out one thing, the version-specific issues. Um, for some reason, developers are well-paid, mostly. Um, and they might only have the latest phones at certain companies, and maybe like only the release engineers aren't paid enough, and they have the old gingerbread phone <laughs> somewhere. We pay our REs good, so um, I think we hire for that too, yeah. um, in case you're interested. Uh, but with automation, we're able to run on gingerbread in the cloud. We get our results right away for every API level, so we don't wait till the last minute to find those problems. Great. Uh, how about the next uh, live question? I think you were up next. Sure. Uh, I'm still Alec Monroe. Um, Stefan. You showed a screen that had all of the different devices, or several of them. Is that an actual tool that you guys have and maybe will release that will, like, you know, if I want to run, I can, say, run this test on all these devices and actually get a view like that? So what I showed in my presentation, I mentioned we have configurations to match device specifications. So in our environment, we have a command line script, and I just type in launch a Nexus 4 API 16. Boom. And since you're at Google, yes, you do have access to that tool, and you can use it today. <laughs> <laughs> but there, is there like a visualization tool that actually looks like what you showed? Oh, um, I shared it internally on the Google Plus. If you want it on your desktop, you know, I, it looks really cool. Yeah, um, right. yeah I, um, yeah, it's there. Yeah, the you other way, work on the eye candy, and if anyone. But actually, has you know, I, I spent about <laughs> half an hour, you know, lining up all these emulators on my desktop. So. <laughs> So in other words, for those of you that can't get it, well, that sucks. Um, yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> what you can do is you can start requesting it in the, you know, the stream like crazy, and maybe you know, they, yeah. they'll pick it up. Mm -hmm. Please okay. do that, uh, guys. We're really, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we probably have time for about one and a half more questions. So please go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Steve. I'm an SET at Google. Um, I mostly have experience with browser automation, not Android animation. Uh, um, automation. Uh, so can you explain what you mean by API level? Yeah, so uh, every device, um, well, the latest devices are running Gingerbread. It's the OS level, maybe, is more common. And uh, the APIs available to developers have increased um, pretty much with each new version. So you have Eclair, Froyo, Gingerbread, Honeycomb, ICS, Jellybean, and each one adds a little more features. They might tweak the semantics of an API and you can get bugs that reproduce on gingerbread, but not on ICS, and even vice versa. Why so. do you say API level rather than OS level? So, so if it's, you, yeah. it's easy because you know they call it uh, ice cream sandwich, ice cream sandwich, master release one, jelly bean, jelly bean, rest, master release one, and so on. But what they do, what they really do good, and they can count. They say API 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then it's easy for us to reproduce, right? If somebody call me, I say, which API level, right? I, I can't remember, and I can't match those names. Great. Actually, you probably can. <laughs> if there is a person who can, it's you. All right, uh, we have time for a very quick question, so please. Hi, I'm uh, Greg Wester at Salesforce.com. I'm a lead engineer. Um, what we see a lot of times is, um, Automated tests catch um, functional problems with the program, and that's fine. But the devices themselves carry a lot of state. And so we find our users get into weird things. They don't upgrade for a while. And then something bad happens in the device, and user experience gets hurt, even if you were functionally correct in writing your tests. Um, can snapshotting help that? You know, when people are on a very old version and upgrade, there's some metadata, there's some session. There's a lot of weird things that happen in the real world that ultimately I think we're all in this business to help users have a good experience and we're supposed to catch it first. So how do you address that? So snapshotting is actually an emulator specific feature. It's a dump of RAM, CPU, and hardware registers. So it's a little more low level than your upgrade problems. 
and that actually uh, backwards compatibility is a difficult issue. Um, it's something that we could like reproduce on an emulator with an old APK and a new APK. It takes a lot of effort to get there. Um, and what I would suggest first is to get better coverage around your app um, before you start tackling these scenarios. But it definitely is a difficult area to work in. Great. So. And with that, uh, thank you guys. Um, it was fantastic. Thank you.